Welcome to another catch-up episode of the Mind Duck Books podcast. Joining me again is Christina, Adam, and Martin. Full-on Czech episode today. <laughs> In English. In English, not Czech. <laughs> How are you, Christina? Thanks for coming back. Hello. Uh, you've been reading loads of books and translating loads of books on the episode <laughs> that we had you maybe a few months ago. We talked about the book you were translating. Have you finished it? The one where the... A thank you note from the writer was in the book. I forgot the name of it. But... Yeah, yeah, that that one I had finished. That's probably coming out around around now. Oh, cool! Congratulations. Yeah, I I, I won't. Uh, uh, it, it's not very professional of me to bad mouth it so much. I don't think it's a problem at all. <laughs> you should. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much interested in the name. Uh, we, um, we said the name in the previous episode anyway, so too late now. Okay. Yes. <laughs> well, uh, never mind then. Let's not let's not remind anyone. <laughs> If you want to know the name of the book, listen, listen to our to... previous episode. <laughs> yeah. How are you, Adam? It's been a while or two for you to come back on the podcast. Yeah, yeah good, good. I've read a lot of books and don't have much to say about them. <laughs> Hopefully the one I picked I have more to say about. <laughs> I am super excited to talk about the book you've got today. We've planned this maybe four times to talk about this series. And when we first said it, it was just the first book. And now there are eight volumes and there's the ninth uh, one coming out. I, and I, 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 will, I will get to that. It's there so is a much. lot. That is many volumes. <laughs> it's insane. Yeah, I'm very much interested in, in this other isekai that seems to be never ending and the author is just churning out more and more books. Yeah. And of course, Martin has uh, emerged from his depth of drowning in Brandon Sanderson. Oh, yeah. How are you? I'm still here, still <laughs> reading Brando. Nothing new. How many uh, Brando Sandel books have you read this year? Maybe three, okay. actually. Okay. Yeah. That's reasonable. Oh, four if you count okay. this short story that I'm about to okay. <laughs> talk about. But yeah, four. So we have very short books today and we have a normal book and then we have like an insanity from Adam. I don't understand how you read all this. But before we start and get into it, I'd like to have a quick question for you because it's all Czech guests today. If you were to say a book that's Czech, do people who don't know that the Czech Republic exists as an example of Czech culture or of something that you would be proud of or you liked? Is there anything like that you can think of? Saturnin. Oh, okay. Uh, and that has the advantage of being translated into English. Mm -hmm. uh, there's there's other books. Uh, I really enjoy the short stories by Ivan Kraus. They are okay, extremely sounds... funny. Uh, well, most of them are very funny. But I don't... Well, they might have been translated into other languages because he's lived all over Europe, so... Mm -hmm. Yeah. For me, I think I haven't read many Czech books, but uh, if there's one thing that I find interesting, uh, those are books from Zdeněk Svěrák and like uh, all the things around him with the uh, Simmerman Theater. That I think I would recommend as a kind of a, a satiric look at the, mm -hmm. <laughs> at the Czech nature. I think that's actually a very good recommendation because it's a very nice, almost wholesome like kind of style. That's not very common outside of Czech culture. Uh, yeah. Same as Martin, I, I don't really read much Czech literature at all. I, if anything, I probably enjoy Čapek quite a bit. But That's my answer, that's yes. The, uh, that's yeah, I, for it. <laughs> I was imagining that. <laughs> When I talk to in like international friends, they usually know that Czechoslovakia existed and then they're surprised that it's just Czechia now and then they are surprised it's not Russia and all that, that always happens. But there are two writers that they always know about, it's Franz Kafka and then Milan Kundera. And uh, I'm always like, why those? I hate Kafka so much. Yeah, so like the Same. ultimate depression. <laughs> yes. If, if I, I just thought of another recommendation. If uh, you really like folk tales and um, like hmm. maybe fairy tales, I did find a translation of Erben's Kitice. I don't know what okay. they're calling it. If if they they're calling it the bouquet or whatever, it sounds weird mm -hmm. in English. But uh, I think <laughs> that is fun. Or well, it is fun. It, it's, it's quite it's quite dark. Different. They're ballads basically. Like Czech folklore. Yeah, folklore exactly, and quite dark. Maybe some of the 
Irish and Scottish folklore tales are kind of similar、mm. in nature, but I haven't heard these these ballads anywhere else. So yeah, I just feel like we are doing our country a disservice. We should have at least one Czech book on this podcast since we're mostly Czech. And I'd like to know you listeners because when we started with this podcast, our audience was about thirty percent Czech, and like forty percent US, and then the rest Japan. Now, since we became a bit more popular, we have about fifty percent US and only three percent Czech Republic. And、uh, oh boy, yeah, we need to work harder. So <laughs> we shouldn't bet now the Americans then. So yes, so I would like to. I have a question for you, listeners. Let us know in the comments or at mindduckbooks at gmail dot com. Do you wanna know more about Czech books, or do you also not care about them? <laughs> <laughs> so if I were to choose one, because I love sci-fi, obviously, I would do R U R. Oh, from Chapek, which、yes. is the book that、uh, created the word robot, which is from the Czech language. If you don't know. A tidbit for the Americans who are listening. <laughs> People don't know that like at all. If I say that、uh, outside of Europe, I think we should read that book because there's. I think all of us here kind of at one point have read this book, right?、Mm. So we we could do an episode on it. Yeah, it、uh, would be interesting. Yeah, or or like with the the plays, right? So you could do more yes, of them yes, at once. Yes, it's very easy. Yeah, to, very short. Milan emots at o r. My favorite has always been the war with the with the newts. Newts. Or with the salamanders, or <laughs> it's like a sci-fi war story where where newts are sentient and they talk、I've、on the radio and、that. they battle each other. I loved that as as a child. I was like, yes, <laughs> battle newts, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what is that? <laughs> Karel Chopek wrote it. <laughs> really? And there are、yeah. comics books I've made out of it, and radio plays. I love it so much. It's it's like oh boy,、okay. I need to find out more about it's this. It's the closest、Wait. you can get to check good sci-fi trash. <laughs> That's why I like it. <laughs> All right. As usual, each of us has one book. This time, me and Christina both read one of them. All of the books are fantasy this time. So the book、uh, Adam has read is one thousand plus pages in the first book, and then it escalates exponentially until the eighth volume having nine thousand pages. Is that correct? That, that sounds about right. <laughs> It's released as web novels on Patreon. Like、okay. I think weekly or something. It's currently at eleven million words. Oh my god! <laughs> so、oh、I checked the like numbers of pages. The first one was one thousand, second two thousand. Then I skipped、yeah. like sixth one was like five thousand, and then then the last one just came out nine thousand pages. What's happening? Who's reading this? I don't know. It, Who it, is it, writing this? I, like, <laughs> oh my I, god! I don't know. I've read theories that this is quite possibly the single longest、uh, literary work by single <laughs> author, and in the shortest time written. <laughs> I have a conspiracy. For, for For reference,、theory. Way of Kings have three hundred and twenty thousand words.、Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, <laughs> it's、what? insane. This is death. I don't know how we do it, Adam. So I'm very curious what this is about.、And、yeah, the... I, I don't read it. I listen to the audiobooks. <laughs> okay, okay, but still, the the person who wrote it is also very peculiar.、Uh, I I wanted to ask you, where do you find these people? Last time when we talked about the book, He Who Fights with Monsters, the guy Shirtaloon. Was like、yeah. a like a very strange character. This time, the writer who we can't even tell if she's or he's a woman or man. Can you pronounce her, her or his name? I, I, uh, I think it's Pirate Abba. Pirate Th- Abba. That's、oh. how the narrator in the audiobooks pronounces it. <laughs> so I was trying very hard to look something up <laughs> about them, <laughs> and there is nothing. There, and- I, f- I think. It was on on their website. There is something like that. They worked at a supermarket, at Costco, and then they, they quit were, and wrote the book. <laughs> they were stocking <laughs> boxes at Costco, and then they made、yep. it to be a writer. And、yep. it's safe to bet she's female, is what I found online, but not confirmed. Yeah. Also,、so. it, her birthday is sometime in March. And she has shaken hands with Eric Weihenmayer,、oh, yeah. who is the first blind person who reached the Mount Everest, the top of Mount Everest, and that's all we know. Yep, that, that, that's it. <laughs>、uh, seems like web novel authors really like their privacy for some reason. So the name of the book is The Wandering Inn, and then all the other books are also called The Wandering Inn, just volume one, two, three, four. Right? Ah,、oh, they they have names. They have、okay. names. The the first one is the Wandering Inn, ju- just the Wandering okay, Inn. Okay, the, okay. The others have other names, but it's the same series. It continues the same story. So I'll let you tell us anything you like, 
I don't know if okay. you want to like spoil parts of it, or I, I will trust you. Tell, tell us what you I, I, think I we should know. <laughs> I won't spoil anything specific other than like the basic setup, the first few chapters, basically. Okay. So, similarly to the He Who Fights With Monsters, it's a literary RPG. It's a bizarre thing that's basically isekai, just Western. Although it focuses a lot less on the mechanics. Unlike, I, I, will, I will be comparing it a lot to the He Who Fights With Monsters. It's, it's more of a slice of life. <laughs> it's always slice of life, first, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. The first few books. So by first few books, you mean first few parts of the first volume? Or you mean the first few, like, giant books? Uh, the giant books. Okay. So first I, few million words. Okay. Yeah, first few million words. It, I, get okay. good, it gets good after 10,000 pages, is what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> Let's start this way. Uh, I'm currently at the third book of The Wandering Inn and at the ninth book of uh, He Who Fights With Monsters. Okay. That is, I'm caught up on the audiobooks for that. The first book in The Wandering Inn series was recently rewritten completely to be up to the standard of the newer books, supposedly. Okay. Uh, which is kind of funny because I really like the first book. I don't really like the others that much, but no, okay. Most of the internet seems to disagree with me. <laughs> And another note on the audiobooks, the narrator is fantastic. It's confirmed it's not the writer herself. I, I don't think there was any speculation that... Is it? How sure. could it be? I don't know. I don't think so. This is <laughs> okay, like... Okay. A... It takes so long to read stuff like that. She's like narrating it while she's writing it at the same time. Yeah, you she's know, just, just like... straight up just <laughs> saying it. And it's both production <laughs> yeah. audiobook and it's written down by AI immediately. No editing. <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, about the story. Uh, two main characters, there is Eren and there is uh, Ryoka. Uh, Eren is um, kind of younger, I think she's about 20. She's kind of naive, outgoing, and she gets randomly transported into a fantasy world. So she's from our world. No explanation, just appears there. And the story basically starts with her trying to survive. And she basically discovers this inn, uh, this abandoned inn that she cleans. <laughs> to be able to live in it, and that's how she levels up and becomes an innkeeper. <laughs> how does it happen? Like, what happens when she levels up? When she goes to the, the mechanic is so that when she goes to sleep, voice in her head also leveled up. <laughs> oh, okay. And this is your <laughs> very new convenient. Ability. It doesn't what, what explain do anything now? about the ability. <laughs> That's not unusual in these transmigration novels or oh. transportation uh, stories. Yeah. Okay. That's uh, that is a theme that I have seen before. So, is there like a quest that she's given at the beginning? No, no. no. Uh, unlike the Hue fights with monsters, that starts with like quest system. Uh, this one doesn't have a quest system. This really. Yeah. Has much less. The the RPG mechanics are much less prominent. There is the leveling up, but nobody really understands how it works. It's kind of part of the mystery that they build up and try to uncover, which is quite interesting. But it's uh, not uh, at this point a huge part of the book. I think it's more important later on. I was surprised Christina knows these kinds of books because I was about to say you are probably the least. Uh informed because you don't game as much but no i am the least informed i have read <laughs> I know nothing many about this. sea novels uh, okay so uh, yeah that that is something that i've uh, i've encountered before yeah do you like that sometimes yeah uh, okay. th there's very often there's other things accompanying that i like that concept very often there's other mm -hmm. things accompanying that that i don't necessarily enjoy reading about like all those har all that harem stuff it's like yeah eh, can we not <laughs> yeah that's great i'm just surprised that you do it, it it's a bit so of a literally a... junk food i feel but <laughs> yeah it's it's fun <laughs> is it worse junk food than my sci-fi trash or not i think it's not kind of di different what do we mean my sci-fi trash for so example speaking of czech book and czech writers there is uh, i think it's milan kopřiva and he writes asphalt it's a bunch of marines going to hell to shoot guns at Satan. I don't think it's that bad. No, this, this is compared to. I think this is pretty good. I think <laughs> yeah, this is pretty good. Trash. <laughs> it's, it's it's no Sanderson, but uh, like it's pr pretty good. So it's more of a freestyle RPG. It's not like very well defined. It's like more yeah. of a mystery. Like, how the, the, the world thing works that a lot of these books rely on a lot is uh, like world building. That's big part of it. Like there is a sit. Like yeah, it's a okay. human city next to the inn, uh, so she deals with racism towards humans. 
they don't want to sell her stuff, not really communicate with her at all. But she somehow like befriends some of them. The, there is the the guardsman Relk. They are the Antinium. Uh, it delves a lot into the history of the world. Like there are Antinium wars and politics regarding that. That's all really hmm. nice. I, I re- like this about the first book that it delved into a lot of these things, and it still kept the like slice of life. I think it was kind of lighthearted, more or less. It sounds really cool. Uh, needless to say, Ains got nobody, no time for none of that. But let's say we did have time for some of that. What's the pacing like? Does it, does it keep your attention? I mean, g- g- given how long it is, it is a bit slower. But I never had issues with the first book being... I, I, I didn't really mind in the first book. It was interesting build up of the world. But once the world is a bit more built up, it slows down because you just have to go through some things that are not that interesting. Mm. Uh, anyway, there's the second character that's introduced later on in the book, uh, Ryoka. Young woman, incredibly stubborn. And the interesting thing, she refuses to partake in the game systems. Uh, you can technically, as she found out, refuse to level up. <laughs> I okay, suppose. so it's like yeah. Pikachu in Pokemon. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> one way to put it there. <laughs> But one issue is, that for some reason, people absolutely despise her, like readers, not people in the world, although they mm. kind of despise her too, but for different reasons. Because she ran in her previous world, uh, she's now an incredible runner in this world. Apparently people just can't run. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Unless they have like skills for it. And she has this weird thing that lights up. It's an iPhone. Um, <laughs> that magically works. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't know if that was explained that at the beginning. So, I didn't really get it. Although maybe it did go discharged at some point. It was kind of weird. Later on, she finds out when she finds a magician that can like cast a repair spell and it charges up. Uh, <laughs> so it's very convenient. <laughs> very nice spell. Well, I wanted to quickly talk about what the appeal was, because obviously the world is interesting and the story like uses the gimmicks of not leveling up and all these things, but what is the thing that keeps you going? Is it the humor? This one is not nearly as funny as uh, He Who Fights With Monsters. That one has like quips all the time. There are like serious parts and less serious parts. This one is kind of on the middle ground. It's a lot more like serious, but lighthearted. But not funny. It's not going for like comedy mm-hmm. at all. Okay. The, the world that builds up yeah. is really cool, and the the, like, the larger story that it introduces, I I really like that. So there is like an overarching story yeah. that's going somewhere. Yeah. yeah. And, like, later yeah, yeah. on, and especially in the second and third book, a lot more of the overarching story, uh, which is save the world kind of story, uh, gets introduced. But I don't really care about the main characters. Neither of them. Oh no! <laughs> oh no! Like, I don't mind that. Be like the, the internet thing. seems to be I divided to on whether they love or hate them. I just don't really care at this point. <laughs> oh okay. I, honestly, I just jump forward a bit. I probably won't be listening to more, or at least I will take a longer oh, break yeah, from, my other uh, from yeah. this series. I'm still listening to You Fights with Monsters. That's fantastic. I love it. So you'd prefer that one, right? Definitely. Definitely. Okay. Yeah, I'm very, very intrigued. I've never tried any of these kinds of books. What do you think, Martina and Christina? Are you sold on this? Do you want to give this a go? Would you commit to 10,000 no. pages? <laughs> Sorry, no. <laughs> <laughs> Really I'm nice. actually like uh, I, you've sold me on the lore part. I'm kind of interested in the <laughs> I was Antinium to... <laughs> wars and everything that happened in the past. Uh, yep. One question: What no, are they're, they're the Antinium? Ants. What, what is that actually? The hu- like... huge ants. Yeah, they they like they have. Uh, they are the there is the queen obviously. Then there are the soldiers who are kind of like mindless giant beasts. Then there are the few yeah. that are like intelligent because most of them are not. Most of them are part of the hive mind. So it's more like a swarm mind, same as normal ant kind hive of, would be. Kind of. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. to, to like spoil a little bit of what it gets into, the goal of the Antinium is to gain more sentience because uh, the workers are kind of weak. Even the soldiers are kind of weak. They are strong because they are huge and powerful, but they are stupid. They can't think for themselves. Uh, but they can technically produce like intelligent warriors 
but it's very resource intensive. They can't do man make many of them. They also can't use magic and they are trying to resolve this. Incredibly interesting plot point. They do a lot of uh, like different points of views. Sometimes it's uh, Eren, the main character, or Ryoka, uh, but sometimes you get um, point of view of one of the Antinium. Mm. You even get some point of view from side of the goblins. Uh, there is entire plot point with uh, this goblin that's uh, like manages to uh, level up and stuff like that. I guess I can spoil that, it's not a big spoiler. Someone introduces chess to the world and they discover that, that by playing chess, they level up in strategist class. Oh, okay. <laughs> so they can, you can like grind chess to, to level up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nice. So, to, I'm gonna like sum, sum it up overall, okay? So the, the, the characters are in a way annoying. They improve over time. Like Eren is annoyingly borderline dumb, extremely naive. Extremely naive okay. is probably the best way to put it. That's kind of annoying. Ryoka on the other hand is incredibly stubborn, which is annoying on its own. But that, that's fine. There is a lot of different points of views, and some of them are fascinating. The Antidium sites, I, I love those. Then in the third book, there is another mm -hmm. one with uh, this Emperor. That's fantastic. The way they explore the RPG elements if without it feeling like game mechanics is really nice. I enjoyed that a lot. But especially the second and third book, they just kind of drag. I think the problem is that it's not written <laughs> in a way that uh, as a regular book with a beginning and an end. It's an ongoing process where yeah, you yeah, weekly that's, release that's a big chapters. concern for me. <laughs> and it's, when you make a book out of it, there is not really a good ending, a good beginning and a good end to it. Which is why I would recommend maybe the first book because it has more of an ending to it. Mm -hmm. It's a good question for writers. Is it even possible to have a 10,000 page book and That's not have it as long? What is yeah. this? Is it possible to have <laughs> 11 million like, words series and not have it as long? It's almost like they give it too much life. Like the writer just keeps writing and writing as if the characters were like alive, leading their life, everyday slice of life, what would happen? And then they just kind of like live. Yeah. But it's like sitcoms of books. I yes, guess, right? and, but but who who wants that? Like, who is this for? Well, you know, yeah. telenovela writers, okay. soap opera writers. I, I think they it's do the same thing. Light reading. True. You just true. you you have to find a point. You have to find a point where you finish one part to be tantalizing enough for somebody to click on the next thing, mm. and that is tricky. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and people do get tired of it, but I imagine that there are some who just create enough of a bond yes. with the characters that they need to know what happens next. Okay, they need true. them to be okay, and they go on reading. Maybe I'm completely missing the point, because in my like entertainment media wise, I always enjoy something that's very... Like in your face, very you need like, a message. challenging. You need something that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do it, like mind duck. But recently, I've been very tired and stressed, and I was asking people what to do, and they told me, you know, read something dumb or slow or like relaxing or do something very comforting that you don't have to think about very much. So maybe I'm completely missing the point. Maybe yeah, this is exactly possibly. what I need like, right it's now. It's kind of in the name on the Japanese side of things. You have kind of a category of books that's light novels. An entire point is that they are supposed to be kind of easy to read. Hmm. Just to uh, be comforted, yeah. yes. The details kind of don't matter either, or they are vague enough that you can kind of piece it together even if you skip a bit forward. Yeah, but thank you so much for telling me about this. I was super curious about this. I hope I finally kind of understand what this is. So <laughs> it's good. I hope you listeners uh, can make your decisions too if you want to read that. So the next book we wanted to mention uh, was a book we planned to do a full episode about, but after we both read it, I and Christina, we had the same reaction. I guess we didn't know if you liked it. And then we said, probably yes, but there's nothing to say. <laughs> yeah, kind of. <laughs> like, it's fine. Like, it's, it's the definition of fine. Like, I don't have any critiques for it. I don't have any extra praise for it. I did like it, but I wasn't 
surprised nor amazed by it. Would you say you feel the same? Well, I I liked it. I think I was expecting mm-hmm. something more from it. I was uh, expecting it to come out with uh, some kind of a not 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 point, not a solution, some kind of a message, and uh, uh, then the m- message ended up being quite dispiriting, maybe. <laughs> So the book is called Pulling the Wings of Angels by K.J. Parker. It's only 144 pages. It came out very recently, 2022. And the writer, we don't have to talk about that much, I guess. I don't think so. It's interesting that they kept their name secret for 17 years and only recently it came out that the real name is Tom Holt. Oh. Uh, guy from the UK. So I did guess. he write anything else before? Like yeah, yeah, this? a lot. Okay. He writes mythopoetic novels, which is something like a twist or parody or a spin on certain aspects of mythology. Hmm. Okay. So this book takes place in the medieval times, which I didn't know until the end of the book. <laughs> I was like, when is this taking place? <laughs> did they like not mention it? Am I dumb or did you have the same feeling? Like what happened? There's uh there's clues okay. that, that it's I taking place in a different world. It like there are clues. But they are not in your face, so I can see how you like somebody would, would miss that. So a summary without spoilers is that it's based on mythology of angels and god and there's like a twist and like a kind of message like christina said that's a little bit i don't even know what i, I would describe it like do you think it made, made you feel depressed or no not not depressed maybe bemused would be the best word for it okay okay uh, <laughs> but there was some f- philosophical Mm-hmm. ideas there that I I thought were quite interesting, especially when it comes to their concept of God and what it is and what is mm-hmm. good and what is not good. And this very, it had this very Deadpool-esque uh, view <laughs> of the world right. and mm-hmm. how the world works. There's quite a nice passage about justice that I thought if you don't mind I could I could read that yeah that's fun. that was yeah, of course. I thought it was quite fun in this kind of bittersweet way and it's like it's not fair I said what you're doing to me another sigh well come on she said what's justice observing the law what's law laws the rules who makes the rules I do If only you'd been to law school instead of wasting everybody's time at the seminary, you know that. In criminal law, the definition of a crime is something that's against the law. That's it. Finish. They teach you that on your first day after you've been told where to hang your coat and where the toilets are. I make the rules. The rules say you're guilty. Even though I'd done nothing wrong? Even though, she said, you've done nothing wrong. Well, apart from not selling everything you own and giving the money to the poor. That's really bad, you know. Right, I said, and something clicked inside my head. An epiphany, almost. Fine. Suppose everybody did that, like they're supposed to. What would happen? She looked at me. Go on. The rich, I said, would all be poor, and the poor would suddenly all be rich. Then what? Presumably the poor would have to sell all the stuff they bought with the money they've got from the rich and give it to the rich who are now the poor and then the rich would have to give it all up back. That's not the kingdom of heaven. That's silly. <laughs> yeah, I like the part though. Yeah. That was that was I guess the main message or kind of like the why it was written kind I of I guess. Yeah. So yeah. I'll try to sum it up very, very briefly because I don't think it's necessary to explain the details. Please correct me, (laughs) because I'll probably say it wrong. So the book starts with a guy, I thought when I started reading it, being held at gunpoint, but obviously they don't have guns, so no. They are threatening to cut off his nose, so I guess at sword or knife point, he's uh, owing them money. Uh, He he gambled it away. Okay, Uh, and this guy uh, called Florio, who is like the bad guy of the story is demanding him to pay back and then stuff happens and what happens is the name of the book they find that florio is trying to get to a secret underground chamber that has a cage and an angel is imprisoned in it and the cage and the chamber has been built by the 
most intelligent person in the world, they call him, or the wisest man in the world, something like that. He has, by experimentation and technological advancement, devised a method how to construct a place where God cannot see. And that made him... Uh, uh. Somehow he managed to do that. Let's not explain how, how he did he it. How does he know that the god cannot see? Like, like god, god, that god even appears in the book, and he like, people like talk to him, and he can like react to things that happens. And he's looking for the angel, and this is like a blind spot for him that he cannot save, rescue, and free the angel. And that's how they know he cannot see that place because. Oh, yes. so so it's like Sandman, the beginning of Sandman, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> so basically, this wisest, cleverest man, he traps an angel, and he knows it worked because the angel is trapped and not rescued by God, who, if he could see the angel, could immediately rescue him or her. Mm. Um, and then the way they trapped the angel was to literally break off the wings. And uh, you would think the name of the book is not literal, but it's very literal. And the wings are described to break off as chicken wings and they bleed mercury, mercury or silver. Or it something. is very graphic. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so it snaps off like a chicken wing and they have to do it repeatedly because the wings to grow back. And when the angel has full span of the wings, they regain power and they would break off, out, break out of the cage and leave. Oh, boy. So that's basically the premise, and mixed into this is discussion about what's just, what's not just, what does it mean to be a god and follow God's word, and what would it mean if God didn't exist and we could stop him from judging us, which is where the book ends. Uh, I recommend it. Okay, I don't know if I recommend yeah. it. It was so easy and fast, and why not? It is a short read and I think it's an interesting read. I I don't think I would want it to be longer to be honest. Oh okay, I would I would. It's it's interesting to to read and think about some of the concepts, see if you agree with them, hmm. see if it's just some crazy bullshit. But <laughs> I I thought uh, it was interesting and despite the graphic nature of it, quite funny. It was funny. That's true. It was fun to read. Yeah. And the uh, points were poignant enough and made you think about the issues and I enjoyed it very much but I think it didn't go too much in depth and it was mm. just like asking a few quick questions and to me it was a bit forgettable I forgot like it kind of quickly like I like the idea behind it but already I don't remember the characters very much and like the ending I remember the point but I don't remember like how exactly it happened and all that mm. so it's okay <laughs> <laughs> For me, I don't think it's great. <laughs> yeah, but I'm happy you would recommend it. I, I think it's not bad at all. Like it's that's not what I'm saying. So unless you have any question, I guess we can move to the next one. I was kind of interested in the writing style. From the passage you have uh, read, it kind of sounds like it's very fun to read. Actually, it's very modern, it's very contemporary writing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It kind of reminded me of how I have to kind of. At this Brandon Sanderson <laughs> uh, connection here, but like it sounds as if Hoyt was a skybreaker and he just oh, no. talked oh, about no. law. Uh, oh, no. So, so for all the Brandon Sanderson fans, <laughs> you will understand. Okay. And the rest of us shall but never <laughs> understand. You have to read all the books <laughs> to understand. But no, it's a. Uh, it sounds like the writing style is something that I would enjoy, but the concept is something that I will not. So I don't oh, know. Okay. I'm, I'm for me, of... it was the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I like both. I, I like to say the same as Martin concept. in how like witty it was, mm. but I'm not really keen on the violence and even less so on the philosophy. So yeah, uh, maybe. Yeah, it's a, it's a it's an interesting mix. But I was perplexed how we were both like, yeah. So how did you like it? And <laughs> we were both like, I don't know. Like it's a it's a thing. Mediocre. <laughs> like uh, that's yeah, I think yeah. there's there's that disconnect between the style of writing which is kind of Maybe that's why. i guess flippant mm -hmm. flippant at times and then the actions of the book which are quite dark quite desperate quite hopeless when you kind of consider the situation in full for the for the narrator of the story there's no escape 
nothing at all that uh, he can do to better his situation or to somehow, you know, mm -hmm. and he's not a terrible person, but he's not very good either. Mm -hmm. Like, you would not like him if you met him face to face. So I, I was about to say the ending, but let's not. I think if you're intrigued, we'd recommend it. I think you can spend 144 pages to read this mm. very easily. And that is something to ponder about. And there is an ending to experience that's not bad at all. And I think that religious people will have a very different experience oh, yes. with the book than I did. Yes, that's a good point. <laughs> yes. I would be curious what uh, yeah, somebody yeah, who was actually religious, religious here, so would think about this. Yeah, that would be interesting uh, to know. Yeah. Um, my book uh, is the first of a trilogy. It's called Dreamer's Pool, uh, written by Juliette Marillier. Uh, and it, the, the genre is historical fantasy. Mm -hmm. And uh, let me just say, say straight off the bat, I am not objective about this book. This book is fucking brilliant. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's, not setting it's... the expectations too high, I see. Okay. Uh, like, okay, maybe it's not everybody's cup of tea. But I think if you enjoy fantasy, if you enjoy historical fantasy, you will enjoy this. It's not epic. Mm. It's very much a character study. The way uh, this is structured is that you have a uh, point of views. You start the story with uh, a woman whose name is now Blackthorn. Uh, mm -hmm. She is, a, or she was, a wise woman, a healer. And uh, she saw an injustice being done and she spoke up about it. And then she got locked up. She got put in prison for an entire year. Terrible kind of place. And it's uh, it's broken her down. And now she's coming up on the one year since she's been put into this prison. And by law of the land, she should now have the opportunity to uh, get to speak to not just the man who locked her up, but other chieftains who would then see justice done. Okay. And that's the one thing she's holding on to. So this place or world is partially based on real history? Well, it is set in Ireland, mm -hmm. but I, I would hesitate to n name a century. <laughs> that's fine. I was just reading that it's historical fiction, uh, usually what she writes. Yeah. So I was curious how much that plays a role. It is historical, but it is also fantasy. Okay. Can I have a question? What is the fantasy aspect of this book? The classical folklore of Ireland, of there being the fair folk who may or may not be real. They are real. All oh, right. <laughs> and they're fucking amazing. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're not. They're kind of mad. It's the, it's the people. So you can just like really meet, meet make... a leprechaun, you know, in real life there. And... It's not like top of the morning to you, whatever. Mm. No. Okay, maybe it will help if I tell you more about the author. So, okay. Juliette Marillier has been a full-time writer for over 20 years. She was born in New Zealand. Now she lives in Western Australia. And she is also a member of the of the Druid Order. I was waiting oh. for this. Okay, okay. <laughs> that explains it's, a lot. It's the Order of Bards, Ovids and Druids. Or uh, What is an yes. Ovid? Oh wait, I was looking this up. No idea. It's a prophet or a seer or like a divine healer. But uh, I don't know how you pronounce this word. <laughs> so excuse me. <laughs> I, I think her values are very much reflected in her world. Very often it's about the human relationship with nature and how they how they treat the world around them and other beings around them. Have you seen their website? <laughs> the OBOD website? The, mm, the no. Druid. I was trying to look up stuff. It's, it's very charming. I, I can't make up my mind about it. They say they teach beliefs and history of druidism. And she looks like the sweetest grandmother you could imagine because she said she, she's got four children, eight grandchildren. She has a small pack of rescue dogs. She's got like <laughs> white hair holding dogs. 
<laughs> and she is skilled. She she knows like like writing is a craft and she knows it. There is a very nicely wrought plot or mm-hmm. two of them that go through the first book and then some of them continue on to the second book and the third book. But also the the arc of the characters are very nicely done. When you meet Blackthorn, she is just extremely believably broken and savage mm. and and angry and slowly she all she wants is vengeance and justice for what was done to her and what was done to other people and there is no way of achieving that she i kind of stopped the story when I like like the next day, right? She's supposed to go to this big meeting with the uh, with the chieftains and finally get to plead her case. But then one of the guards who's been abusing everybody comes and just tells her that that's not going to happen because there are orders to get her out out of the way before that. Hmm. And so she knows that everything is hopeless. But then suddenly, she has a visitor, and this is one of the one of the fair folk. She doesn't trust him. She doesn't know him. He tells her that he has a task for her. If she says yes, she will go to the kingdom of Dalriada. She will live by the forest there and she will say yes to pleas for help from whoever asks her for seven years mm. she will not seek her revenge she will not ride south to confront this evil man Mathewin of Leash if she does basically the implication is that uh, he will turn back time and send her back to this exact moment oh. when she's waiting to be killed and she waits too long she doesn't give him an answer and then he disappears she's led back to her cell and she basically she she breaks mm. but then suddenly uh the ceiling falls through and she has a chance to escape and that is what she does and that's where the story starts <laughs> it's uh, i can really recommend it it's the writing style is lovely and the story really grips you and you want to know what happens. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a trilogy, right? Mm-hmm. Have you read all of them? Yeah. So does it get better? Because the reviews seem to be much better with each sequel. <laughs> like people seem to be loving the sequel and the last one the most. I think I enjoyed all of them. Yeah, yeah. I enjoyed the second one the least, I okay. think. But the story is very compelling. And the third book I also enjoyed. No. I'm not entirely satisfied with how it was wrapped up. I think was my question, at yes. the same time I don't <laughs> see how it could have been done any other way. So but the the characters they really make it work worth it. We always talk about this with Paolo uh, when he talked about the Broken Earth trilogy for example that we like kind of really like trilogies because it's a compromise between what we said with the really long stories and then having like an ending and if it really sticks and lands the ending then we like that's that's awesome. So this one kind of yes you'd say. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Like the each of the story if each of the books has its own uh, has its own plots has its own stuff going on but mm-hmm. overall there is an overarching story and that is the threat of this man Mathewin who mm. is just very dangerous very powerful and very bad okay we always talk about the magic systems and all these fights and action is that a part of this story it's, it's the way I prefer it where you don't see behind the screen you don't see the workings of it it's kind of quiet so it's the game of thrones style kind of like mm-hmm. it's there but it's just as a kind of a uh, flavor to the whole story yes exactly it's it's not you know gandalf and saruman mm. beating each other to to <laughs> shit with their yeah. uh, with their magic stuffs <laughs> okay sounds sounds great i think i'd be interested. Uh, each of the books is about 400 pages, so that's something that's not as much of a time investment. Maybe. It might be an interesting change of pace from the very like specific RPG systems of the fantasy I read recently, so maybe. Mm-hmm. I'm intrigued. 
similar for me, I think. I think I would enjoy. Like, I should try this one. I don't know if I would enjoy, but I should try this one. So if we, and if I also think, it, like, pa- you should Paolo, come back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think Paolo, Paolo would, love would this. enjoy this one <laughs> very much. Yeah. It has the right amount of history uh, for yeah, him yeah, to, yeah, yeah. to be interested, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, Martin has done the impossible and he's. He's chosen a Brandon Sanderson book for today that's only 190 pages long. What is that? It's an accident. Like us. <laughs> so I'm super curious if that's good because I feel like it can't be based on what I've read and heard. Yeah, I would say it is very good uh, from my point of view. Uh, and it's... I don't know if it's like the shortest concise story from Brandon Sanderson, uh, but it definitely is one that I would think all of you here would kind of enjoy because it's it doesn't have anything to do with other things from Brandon Sanderson that much. So you can just read it uh, without any knowledge of Brando Sando, any knowledge of the Cosmere or stuff, but it actually is part of the Cosmere. So the name is The Emperor's Soul. Yeah, the name is The Emperor's Soul. It's uh, originally released in 2012, I think. It's actually a really good introduction to the magic that Brandon Sanderson is going for, usually, without knowing anything so about it. So by magic, it. do you mean the magic of reading it or the magic of the magicians in the, the book? The magic system <laughs> okay, okay, okay. of... of, of uh, ha- the magic systems that Brandon kind of likes, mm-hmm. I think. I guess we can say that uh, the, the, the book is short, you kind of pointed it out that it only has like 160 70 pages you can also like get the audiobook and the, the dramatized version from graphic audio that we have been talking about uh, around other brandon sanderson's books that is actually free on oh, audible cool. so you can just oh, that's a good yeah, recommendation you can just <laughs> get get the free book with graphic audio i tried listening to it i'm not generally a fan of the graphic audio stuff but uh, this one was pretty nice to listen to, actually. So maybe to tell something about the book, I'll I've pre- I prepared a short setup <laughs> for. for <laughs> Christina hasn't been here with Martin before. I don't think Martin always has an essay or he prepares like a reenactment or he's got like a character play reading or something. Yeah, don't 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 uh, don't uh, do it too much. I don't know what you're doing today, you know, but it's always something special. It's it's, so it's not going to be something extremely special, but I will read it uh, and you you can judge it yourself. <laughs> so the setup: the Rose Empire is in turmoil as assassins have gravely injured Emperor Ashravan and murders his wife, leaving him in seclusion for hundred days to mourn her death. However, the Emperor's injury has left him an empty husk without consciousness, which is known only to his closest counselors, the Five Arbiters. Being the actual rulers of the Empire, the Arbiters are driven by fear of losing their positions when the secret is out. Thus, they opt for heresy of the highest caliber. They recruit a convict forger, Van Shailu, and task her with the impossible feat to recreate the Emperor's soul and restore him to the former glory of his own self in only 100 days. Hmm. Van Shailu has no choice but to agree, and in the 100 days she must learn to know the Emperor better than anyone else, as well as try to figure out a plan how not to get executed by the Arbiters after her task is done. Uh, and uh, to say more about the main character, uh, that's Wan Shai Lu. Uh, she is a master forger, and she really loves and is proud of her trade. Uh, but uh, when when you talk about forging, uh, it's not something that we imagine forgery to be like in our real world. It's more of a magic kind of forgery. Uh, Although she would be a very good forger uh, in our own traditional way, she would be very excellent at forging because she's trained in that as well. But her trade is more magical in kind, uh, in that she can manipulate objects' nature and appearance by marking them with so-called soul stamps, which are just stamps that are carved in a way that they kind of... uh, tell a story about the history of the object, 
and uh, if you stamp an object with it, the history gets rewritten in a certain way that kind of changes its nature in the present day. Mm -hmm. So you kind of, for example, can take uh, an old worn down cup from the Wandering Inn uh, before it was cleaned up, I guess, uh, and then <laughs> rewrite its history so that it was in possession of someone who took a good care of it each day. And uh, of that would kind of restore it to its original formal glory because in its in the cup's history now it was taken care of every day so it's much better uh, in much better form nowadays mm. and that's how the magic system kind of works uh but but the kind of complication with that is that the change has to be believable otherwise the forgery doesn't work mm. or only works for like a short time and so, as, as a forger, you must be essentially a master at tracing the past and personality of objects you want to mold, so that you can rewrite a specific moment in its history. There lies the problem for Shai, because she, she has to essentially reforge entire human soul with its memories and personality, and stamp it onto Ashravan, so that nobody would notice mm. that it's actually not him. And that is the plot point of the story. And all is kind of revolving around this plot point. Mm -hmm. Sounds great. Uh, like, yeah. I would be very curious. I kind of want to read this just to see if he can prove himself to be able to write a short story. <laughs> or short story. Like a story with a beginning at an end that doesn't involve 500 pages minimum. <laughs> yeah, please go for <laughs> so, it. This so, one yes. actually doesn't... Yeah, you don't need any knowledge from any other books. And it does have... A concise start, concise end. The characters there are essentially there are two characters only, mm -hmm. and the other kind of are there just to be you know kind of antagonists or plot points, but not really anything important. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I would say that it's worth reading, even though you know nothing about Brandon's book. But also, if you know about Sanderson, this is even better to read because <laughs> uh, it's connected to the Elantris story. Damn it. Uh, <laughs> and <laughs> no idea what it is. It's it's the first book that uh, Sanderson wrote. Uh, uh, it's it's actually the first book that uh, was published by him, and it's the first book from Cosmere. Okay, so so it it doesn't really connect to the Way of Kings. In no, no, any no, no. Way. it's uh, not connected to the Way of okay. Kings. It's just it's just the it's same same universe, universe okay. different planet, essentially. <laughs> <laughs> like, Damn it! <laughs> the point of this was to not connect it to anything. But I like I like that. I, I like the concept as you as you explained it. Or um, I I like the beginning of the story. I'm not very sure about the idea of forging. I don't know if I like the fact that you can rewrite the past in this way of, of the past of an object because it wouldn't be just the past of an object, would it? It of would course. have to be you, you have to the people around it, right? As well. That would have to change and basically you're changing well, the past in this way i don't <laughs> that, 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 kind of, of course that's like easy uh, i think that kind of says a lot about brandon sanderson's magic systems because he makes them in a way that it's believable enough that it could be like based in physics and based in our world but it's still kind of a magic so it if you if you delve too deep into it it kind of breaks at certain ways as you said but it does have an explanation, like what you said about, okay, you would have to actually rewrite the history of other people around it. Sure, if you consider that the object itself kind of views its own history and you don't really rewrite anything about the object, you only rewrite the kind of soul of the object and how it kind of believed that it was kept. And by the belief, only the belief is enough for the object to actually transform into the thing that it's supposed to be. So it's not about the history, it's more about okay. making the object itself believe that it had this kind of history. Maybe I can read a short passage from the book that explains a little bit from the from the point of view of Shai how she was able to do this kind of magic and uh, how it. All right, I'm very sad to say that you've sold me to read even more Sanderson. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will I will read 
just a short part. You can cut it out if you, <laughs> if you don't. But uh, to set it up, it, uh, essentially Shai is uh, a prisoner. She is locked by the arbiters mm-hmm. in this very old and com- unkempt room uh, that they kind of like makeshift put her into. And sh- this is her base of operation. She is guarded by guards, which are called strikers. And it's very hush-hush. Nobody visits her, only like the other character who is called Galtona. To help her with uh, discovering more about the emperor and everything. Mm -hmm. And as she is in this room that's very unkempt, very old, everything is kind of moldy and rusted. And she, you know, while working on her main quest, which is to restore the soul, she's also working on kind of restoring her surroundings to its original glory or even better than its original glory. So slowly her room starts looking better and better. (laughs) And at one point she uh, stamps a wall and the other character, Gautona, uh, the arbiter, is kind of amazed. Of, like, what is this? Like, how did you do? Like, the wall kind of was gray and dark and damaged with water and everything. And suddenly, when she stamps it, the wall, wall like bursts with complex patterns and brilliant colors and all these like paintings, which only like some master painter could produce. Mm-hmm. And the arbiter asks Shai, like, how is this possible? The wall was never painted this way in the past. And Shai responds, and I quote, One of the strikers guarded Atsuko of Jindo during the visit of the Rose Palace, Shai said. Atsuko caught a sickness and was struck in his bedroom for three weeks. That was just one floor up. So your forgery puts him in this room instead? Yes, that was before the water damage that seeped through the ceiling last year, so it's plausible he'd have been placed here. The wall remembers Atsuko spending days too weak to leave, but having the strength for painting. A little each day, a growing pattern of vines, leaves, and berries. To pass the time. But this shouldn't be taken, Gautona said. This forgery is tenuous. You have changed too much. No, Shai said. It's on the line. That line where the greatest beauty is found. Uh, and that's it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Thanks. I will not say more. Yeah, I hate to say it. Yeah, I just want to read it now. Stupid Sanderson. <laughs> I'm happy that I sold you on this one. (laughs) The only way you could have done it, to have a book that's only 200 pages. Yes. But thank you so much for sharing another round of books. If you're listening, let us know if you prefer a book in detail or more books like this in a catch-up episode. And hopefully you found something you'd like to read. I love to hear from people that you read stuff. So (laughs) we don't really think you're dumb people, even though we told you in the recent episode. (laughs) <laughs> read more Sanderson. <laughs> you must read more Sanderson. <laughs> so, thanks a lot for listening, and I'll see you in the next one. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you so much for listening. Rate us on Apple Podcasts, follow us on Spotify, and on the next episode, we are doing what I've planned. And that's to do a book that just came out last month. And it's called Chain Gang All Stars by a writer whose name I cannot pronounce. It's Nana Kwame Ajay Brenya. But a great fun book. I was very excited to get a brand new book as soon as it was published. So join us for the next episode.